who has a definition of the matrix as it pertains to society today? Shalom, Kawa, Ralph Kawa. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of uh, when Abraham, when he compares the children of Israel as the sand of the sea, right? Yes. It could be what else? Something within or from which something else originates, develops, or takes form. Mm-hmm. So if the matrix is here, something takes form or originates. We could say Bamidbar, the wilderness, is a matrix that establishes the misvote of the Hebrew nation, right? Mm-hmm. Or we could say the world is a matrix of chaos and confusion for both good and evil. We can look at it two ways, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. The secular matrix is where average people who do not believe in themselves live. And that's where they do not amount to anything great. They don't think they matter. What I mean when I say escape the matrix is to get out from under the limiting beliefs that we all have that hold us back. The belief that we are less than and what we do doesn't matter. Escape the matrix of the world to be set apart to Hashem because you matter. What are some ways that we can break out of the matrix? Hmm. Question everything? Yeah, question everything, right? Stop yeah. giving up our power to... Uh, an ex- external authority other than Hashem, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm, how about when we question the economic system? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. How Taking about- thoughts, you know, as far as um, re- replacing the ones that we currently hold with a, a different set of thoughts you know can can how about when we detach ourselves from consumerism that's Mm. a big one right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what if we start purging ourselves from media that has another agenda Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what about the foods we eat How can we escape that matrix? (laughs) Right. Read the labels. Eat to live, don't live to eat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's just research, research. (laughs) Um, Something for me um, personally has been Torah study, right? Like once we start to study more Torah, we have realized, you know, how we have been manipulated um, into believing something that is not, actually real right that is pretty much completely detached from the creator right um that would be my main one for me <laughs> like torah study yeah. and then you know from there you open like you open the doors for everything else like you know you, you keep doing more research and you know and like how will say question everything mm-hmm. can absolutely this is crazy so this movie the matrix um by the way, I've never seen it. <laughs> I've ex- escaped the entertainment <laughs> matrix, I guess you'd say. <laughs> but I did read some articles on it, and I'm aware of the blue and the red pill, right? So yeah. the the blue pill says, um, the blue pill means to be ignorant and happy, right? In other words, unconscious. These are the walking dead, right? And the red okay. pill, if you take the red pill, the red pill means... To know the whole truth and when being woke mm-hmm. living so we have choices right and we're going to explore those choices tonight Ooh, i was um looking up this thing 
with um, a matrix. And what does it even mean with math? Nice. Right? And basically, it said that, um, let me start at the part here. It was saying that uh, um, in mathematics, a matrix is a rectangular array or table of numbers, symbols, or expressions arranged in rows and columns, which is used to represent a mathematical object or a property of such an object. And so then I went down some more and it says, without further specification, matrices represent linear maps and allow mm -hmm. explicit computations in linear algebra. So then I looked up linear map and it said that uh, a linear map, what did it say? Yes, it says, thus a linear map is said to be operation preserving. In other words, it does not Ooh. matter whether, right? It does not yes. matter. It does not matter whether the linear map is applied before or after the operations of addition and scalar multiplication. And so then there was one other little thing that I went to. Yes, it says, thus a linear map is one which preserves linear combinations. Mm -hmm. And so um, I thought that that was pretty nifty. Then afterwards, it just starts getting real math heavy. And, yeah, um, but yeah, the, I got real math it, heavy too on that one. <laughs> right, but you know, it's the same thing, like we were talking about that a, a matrix does, even if we weren't gonna use mathematical understanding, is that it preserves stuff. It, you know, whatever is in that matrix, the matrix is, is designed to, um, let's see, nourish the contents of the matrix with what it considers nourishment, you know? Yeah. So whether that's like now when we start thinking about in the world around us, you know, the matrix that is around us is designed to keep us, you know, kind of dumbed down and dependent and stuff like that. And so then it has systems in place and ideologies in place and, and theories in place in order to uphold those things so that we become what it is that they're nurturing us to become. Okay. Okay. The midbar, it means in the wilderness. Let's get to some definitions before we go further into the study. So midbar means an inhabited land or wilderness. Midbar means not only wilderness, but it also includes any land that is uninhabited or uncultivated. The Midrash says that the Torah was given in the wilderness because those that preserved HaTorah kept themselves separate like a wilderness, meaning they're set apart from the secular, from the mundane. One who makes himself like a desert removes himself from everything that might distract him. And there were many explanations in the Midrash. That one to me stood out the most. Can we have the definition of the word count? Anyone want to give us a definition for the word count? What does count. to count mean? To enumerate. Ooh. To, to like tell something. Like if you recount something. Mm. Mm -hmm. I like that oh. one. Or it can be to, to include, right? And depending on what um, topic you're talking about, right? Like you take into account something or include something. And? What else? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can tell a story with numbers. Yeah. You know, you're then? basically at that point kind of looking at facts or, you know, something is um, boiled down to its essences without having an explanation on it yet or an interpretation put on it yet. Ken, how about an act of reciting numbers in ascending order? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and as well as uh, what Rav Kawa said to recount, right? It kind of reminds me of the, of the counting of the Omer when she said that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what about to elevate? Mm -hmm. How about to take into account accountability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To include or even something that matters, right? Mm -hmm. I want to go to uh, their sheet 50, 24 through 25. Twenty-four through twenty-five. Someone like to read? Can okay, I'll read? Okay. Oops. Okay. Wyomer Yosef El Echav Anoki Met. Were Elohim Hakod Yukod et Hem Wa Heela et Hem Min Haaretz Hazot El Haaretz Asher Nishba Le Avraham Le Yitzhak O Yahoo. At length, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. God will surely take notice of you and bring you up from this land to the land promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Wayashba Yosef et B'nai Yisrael Lemor. Pakod Yivkod Elohim et Hem Wahael. Litem et et spotai mize. So Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, When God has taken notice of you, you shall carry up my bones from here. So we see in both of these verses it says, And Hashem will take notice of you. Pachad. Go up to the 24th verse. Pachad. And it means he'll take notice of us, right? That we're not invisible. He can see us, right? Let's go to the etymological dictionary. Let's go back to the screen. And we're looking for the word pekhad, spelled uh, the shorish is going to be pe kuf dalit in the etymological dictionary. Pe kuf dalit. Anyone have the etymological dictionary? Yeah. Yes. Um, right. Let's hear the definition there of pechat. Okay. I've got. Sorry. It's okay. All right. So the definition is invest with purpose or responsibility. Ooh, I right? love that definition, right? So to count would mean to invest with purpose or responsibility. And it could be to take notice of, when you take notice of someone. All right, the next word we're gonna look at is davar. What does Javad mean, class? A word or a thing? Yep. Word, speech, matter. Mm -hmm. How is how Javad matter? Those words are things, right? Yeah. And all of our words are composed of letters, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And numbers. And things that are preserved, like matter. And there's um, the word dabar. So we have devar and dabar. 
Let's go to the etymological dictionary for the Shorish there. Dalit bit Reish. I got it. Um, he has, well, he has 13 definitions in here. Do you want me to read them all? Mm, let's go with the first one. The first one, he says, um, well, the main one, he says, combine separate items into one. And then mm. first definition is collecting, gathering. The second one, it was connecting words for coherent speech. Mm. Th third one is something for, because of, or on account of. Number five, word. Number six, commandment. Number seven, judicial regulation. Number eight, which is something interesting too, expanse of uncultivated land. Number nine, temple interior, place of the word. Ten, bees. Eleven, plague or epidemic. Twelve, raft of latch planks. Thirteen, pasture lands. Mm. I liked the definition you gave. Mm. Connecting words for coherent speech. That sounds out to me because words are put together with letters and all of our letters represent numbers. So when we put words together, we're actually numbering, connecting the numbers to create words. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. That is amazing, but only happens in Ivrit, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the beautiful thing about you know Hebrew. But the very first definition it means to combine or separate items into one, which is really significant considering we're all supposed to operate as one. Everything we do, the words that we speak, on every level, we're supposed to be a chad, right? One with each other and one with Hashem. Okay, that's very, very powerful. You all right? Hallelujah. Let us go to numbers one and two for the last definition I want to look at. Mikawa, I'm going to read. <laughs> Seu et Rosh Ko. Et Rosh Ko Adat Bene Yisrael Lemish Bechotam Levait Avotam Bemis Bar. Shemot kol zahar legul gelotam. Take a census of the whole Israelite company of fighters by the clans of its ancestral houses, listing the names every male head by head. All right, so you see the words Seu et Rosh. Ken. Ken. And this means to take a census, right? It also means to raise the greatness of all the congregation of the children of Israel, to raise the head, right? Because Rosh means head. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why does it say that? To raise the head. Instead of saying to take a census, it says to raise the head. Yeah, that is interesting, you know. What state did we come from? What mm. do you mean? Oh, when we left, oh. left Mitzrayim. <laughs> yeah, we were slaves. 
with our wow. heads down working. Mm-hmm. Can. Mm-hmm. We were in a lowly state, right? A state mm-hmm. where our heads were cast to the lowest of the low as slaves. Mm-hmm. As well as a state of impurity, right? Mm-hmm. Hashem calls us to holiness, an elevated state, to break the cords of the flesh into the elevated state of the spirit. As we were called out of Mitzrayim. So we have the tribes of Lewi around the Mishkan. What did the Kohathites um, what were they in charge of? Does anyone remember? Was it the spices? They were in charge of the ark, the table, the lampstand, uh, the altars, the sacred utensils, and the screen. Oh, how about uh, the Gershonites? Gershonites is another tribe of uh, descendants of Lewi. They were in charge of the tabernacle. I don't, I'm not expecting anyone to remember. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to go over it and go over it again. Remember, we studied by repetition, so we're going to go over it again. So the charge of the tabernacle, the tent, is covering the screen for the entrance of the tent, the hangings of the enclosure, the screen for the entrance of the enclosure, and that surrounded the tabernacle and the altar. And then we have Marari, the tribe of Marari. And Maradiites had charge of the planks of the tabernacle, its bars, posts, sockets, furnishings, and the posts around the enclosure and their sockets, pegs, and cords. And then to the right of the tabernacle, we had, or to the east rather, uh, the Kohinim, who were in charge to the service of Hashem, right? I don't know about you guys. How do you guys picture the Lewites? Do you guys picture them like moving all these objects in the, in the Mishkan? Mm. I never, I never imagined them like that. Mm. I always imagined them like in their garments and praying or something, <laughs> but they were actually doing the work. Mm. What does this tell us as a nation, a nation of priests? It's not just about the garments we put on, right? Mm-hmm. Can, can. There's work to do. There is work to do. My question is, why did Hashem choose the Levites to serve him? Do you all remember when we sinned with the golden calf? Can. When we decided to make our own festivals, right, to Hashem? Can. It wasn't like Easter or christmas or valentine's day or maybe it was right in some way <laughs> let us go to shemot 32 and 26 okay we have a reader 32 and 26 you can go again Toda. you want in hebrew too Ken. Okay. Yeah. Why amod Moshe Beshaar Hama Hamahane? Why you mer me la Adonai? A lie. Why you as fu a lao calbine lewi? Moshe stood up in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for Adonai, come here. And all the men of Levi, of Levi railed to him. So why did Hashem choose the Lewis to serve him? What did Moshe say? Whoever is with Hashem, come here with me, right? And all the men of Levi rallied around him yeah Hashem was dialing out to Israel right Israel whoever is with Hashem come with me and who went with Moshe Levites Mm -hmm. Ken 
Although Hashem cho chooses us all, right? It is the Levites that chose Hashem. They answered the call. All right. On the screen, you see uh, Bereshit 15 and 5. Here we have a reader. Sure. I'll read. Toda. Wayotzer. Wayotze. Oto. Hakutsa. Wayomir. Abet na. Hashemaima. Us far hakokavim im tokal lis kor otam wayomer lo ko yihye zar echa. And he took him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall your offspring be. Hallelujah. So here we see Hashem talking to Abraham about his offspring. They'll be so numerous, right? So we have the word for count here on the screen. And that word is safar. Can we go to the etymological dictionary and have someone read us the definition of the word safar, which means to count? Sound familiar, anyone who's counting the sefarot? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very nice. Oh, wow. Page 175? Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, this means kind of the same thing as Devar. Right. It says combine separate items, tally sums. Ken, nice. Mm -hmm. So we discussed in Parshat Behar Bekotai in detail how we were once light, or spelled with Aleph, as everything was created with light, the light of Bereshit. However, once we partook of the fruit from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, we disobeyed Hashem, we then acquired skins of flesh, or spelled with ayin, skins we could see. The crucial elements for life on earth are often called the building blocks of life, and they can be abbreviated as C-H-N-O-P-S, which stand for carbon, hydrogen, nit nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. What's interesting about this is Hashem formed Mankind from the dust, right? Mm hmm Okay. And the human body is approximately 99% comprised of these six elements. Mm -hmm. So our DNA is made up of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. The remaining 0.15% of the human body is comprised of trace elements. Almost every element on earth was formed from the heart of a star. As Hashem used the dust of the earth to create mankind, the human body is composed of 97 atoms and elements and minerals found in the galaxy are also found on earth. And we were brought forth by perfect design, stardust. So you don't just matter. You literally are matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Midbar reminds us that we count. We matter so much so that Hashem describes the number of his seed offspring as the stars in the sky. He could have described each one of us to anything what he desired, right? Mm -hmm. However, he chose the stars to illustrate it to Abraham. The name of our forefather, Abraham, has a numerical value of 248. Aleph, which equals one, Bait, which equals two, Reish, which equals 200, He, which equals five, and Mem, which equals 40, totals 248. The word Bemidbar also has a numerical value of 248. Calculating, 
bait, which equals two, mem, which equals 40, delet, which equals four, bait, which equals two, and resh, which equals 200, has a total value of 248. Our nation is compared to Torah, to the dust of the earth, and it is also compared to the stars in heaven. This teaches you that when we descend, we descend to the dust. And when we rise, we rise to the stars. Hallelujah. All right. Does anyone know what Rechem means? And what is Rechem? Um, it means a womb. Yes, a womb, right? The word Rakim also has a numerical value of 248. Wow. Resh, which equals 200, Chet, which equals 8, and Mem, which equals 40. The womb. Okay, so what does the womb have to do with Bamid Bar Libya? <laughs> right? We're like, how are you making this make sense? Our matriarchs, the mothers, Imahot, birth the next generation, right? Okay. It is the Imahot who bring through the data of the generation to pass through their, their birth canal, right? Her womb. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know the word for caring or nurturing, having mercy or compassion? Rachamim. And, and Rachamim comes from what Shorish? Uh, Kawa? The same one. Okay. Rakam, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Spelled Reish Chet Mem. It is taught in Nida 30b and 18. To what is a fetus in its mother's room comparable to? And it says, to a folded notebook. And it rests with its hands on its two sides of its head. At the temples, its two arms. On its two knees. And its two heels on its two buttocks. And its head rests between its knees. And its mouth is closed and its umbilicus is open. And it eats from what its mother eats. And it drinks from what it, its mother drinks. And it does not emit increment, lest it kill its mother. Has anyone ever thought of the fact that babies in the womb don't relieve themselves until they are born? Mm. I know, right? That is wild. Wild, <laughs> yeah. But once a baby emerges into the world, the, the closed limbs, mouth and eyes are open. And the open limb, its umbilicus closes. Otherwise, it would not live for even one hour. We will draw from the book of Yob or Yob a reference to the source in the oral tradition and to give meaning to the illustration on the screen. It is said, and a candle is lit for above its head, and it gazes from one end of the world to the other. And in Yov 29 and 3, it says, When his lamp shined above my head, and by his light, I walked through the darkness. And there are no days when a person is in a more blissful state than those days when he is a fetus in his mother's womb. As it is stated in the previous verse, this is Yov 29 and 2. I want to write that one down. If only I were as in the months of old, as in the days when Hashem watched over me. So how can we say that this verse is talking about being in the womb, right? Mm -hmm. The proof that this verse is referring to gestation is as follows. Which are the days that have months, but do not have years? So pregnancy has how many months? Nine months. Nine, Nine months, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does it have years? No. 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 So this this verse is saying, if only I were as in the months of old. It doesn't say anything <laughs> about any years. So this is talking about um, gestation. Mm -hmm. A fetus is taught the entire Torah while in the womb, as it is stated. And he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast to my words. Keep my commandments and live. 
That's in Mishle 4 and 4. When a person enters the world, he is immediately liable to sin due to his loss of Torah knowledge. As the soul leaves its heavenly abode, it is born into the earthly sphere. It must go through a number of descents. At each level, it is taught the Torah in appropriation to that level. Knowing this, we know how that even before Mount Sinai, one is given the Torah. We just need to remember it. It is in the mother's room that the Torah is given to every being. We refer to Torah as light. Why, class? Why do we refer to Torah as light? How do we say the light in Ivrit? Torah. I mean, uh, the light. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was thinking on the right path just different words ha <laughs> or et ha or right mm -hmm. and et ha or has what numerical value Rav Kawa 613 that's right so this is why uh, we refer to the light as Torah so the Torah was given in the womb so the womb Rakam has a numerical value of 248, which we correlate with the words Bamidbar, right, in the wilderness, which the womb is kind of like a wilderness. If we're looking at it as we described in the first um, slide, being separate from the world, right? Yeah, yeah like a matrix. Yes, like a matrix can. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, You'll see on the screen the word Oriel. You see the word or in Oriel? Uh -huh. We spell or alif wav reish, right? So we have the light of L. And the light of L also has a numerical value of 248. Alif, which equals one, wav, which equals six, yod, which equals 10 which equals 200, Aleph, which equals one, and Lamed, which equals 30, totals 248. It's interesting because you could read it also as Uriel, and Uriel is the name of one of the angels that surrounds us and keeps us from harm. It also can be interpreted as the flame of El, which is very interesting in correlation with the flame that is above the the fetus head, right? Mm -hmm. The light of Torah. When a baby enters the world, they are attached to the understanding that the world revolves around them, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there's people that cleave to that idea much longer after after birth. <laughs> Right? And much longer after coming out of the birth canal. When they are hungry, they're fed, right? Okay. When they are tired, we put them to sleep. Mm -hmm. When they cry, we attend to them. They have no clue that there's a whole world around them that is waiting to be revealed. We is everything. And everything is for us. Mm -hmm. And as we grow, we realize that there's a much bigger world inside our little bubble as we journey beyond the ego boundary and embrace love's outer limits, embracing our role in the world. In order to achieve a deep connection with one another, we first let go of our ongoing fascination with our own selves. It's only possible if we have the humility to recognize the connection. Bonding is it not a deep sea dive. It's a see me dive. Looking within one another. Hallelujah.